This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you right there. I'm in your ears. Maybe you're Dustin Campbell or Tim Deputy or Brandon Brooks or our new patrons, Tracy and Drew. Welcome. On this episode of DTNS, Microsoft accidentally uploaded its plans for the next generation of Xbox to a court website. Oops. Plus, soon you'll be able to just walk out of Amazon clothing stores wearing the clothes you want to buy. And Charlotte Henry's here to explain the brave new world of free streaming TV in the UK. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, September 19th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Garaje, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. As I mentioned, Charlotte Henry from the Addition Newsletter is here. Welcome back, Charlotte. Hello. Always a pleasure. I love our little monthly check-ins. I'm very pleased to be here. And it was nice of the UK to give us news like right before you join the show. Yeah, I organized that. I had a word with a few oh, that was people. Good. We've yeah. got a couple of UK based things to sort. Yeah. yeah. Go on, on the show. So let's drop Come some on, guys. Numbers. Come on, guys. Thank that's you. a that's a stable and functioning society right there. Well. Uh well, folks, ex-chairman Elon Musk says a lot of things. And the latest thing he said was he's thinking of moving to having a small monthly payment for use of the X system, which uh, sounds great. <sighs> Here's what else is in the quick hits. Google's Bard, that is the company's conversational AI chat service, can now connect to your Google apps and services. The company announced what it calls Bard extensions in English, at least to start, which can pull relevant information from Gmail, Google Docs, Google Drive, Google Maps, YouTube, and even Google Flights and Hotels information. The company says if you do choose to use the extensions, your content from Gmail and Docs and Drive isn't seen by human reviewers. It's not used by BARD to show you ads or used to train the BARD model overall. Intel announced it will launch its next generation of chips, codenamed Meteor Lake, on December 14th, just in time for holiday shopping. Uh, Metro, Metro Lake? Meteor Lake. Meteor Lake will be the first chip from Intel on its Intel 4 process, which isn't four nanometers, but is supposed to be equivalent. It will also be Intel's first CPU with different chiplets for each component and a dedicated AI coprocessor. Intel also says it should be the most power efficient client processor it's made yet, and it will support Intel's intelligence graphics upscaler, its version of NVIDIA DLSS, which it calls ZXS, X-E-S-S. Intel says it will have battery and performance numbers closer to launch. We mentioned on Monday's show that TSMC still has to send chips it, that it manufactures in the U.S. back to Taiwan for packaging before selling them. After a meeting with TSMC executives, the governor of the U.S. state of Arizona, where TSMC is building plants, said they discussed bringing advanced packaging to Arizona as well. TSMC's Arizona fabrication plants are expected to begin work in 2025. Yeah, get those plants online first before you get the advanced packaging. But uh, researchers at Trend Micro discovered that attackers took a six-year-old Windows backdoor known as either Trochilus, or you may have seen it referred to as NetScout, and combined it with new SOX and implementation to create a Linux backdoor that they're calling Spry SOX. It can collect system information, control a compromised system, transfer data, usual backdoor malware stuff. The malware is spread with social engineering, so if you need to get to a watering hole, so be careful what you click on out there. It appears to be operated by a group targeting governments in Asia. Trend Micro has the IP addresses, file hashes, and other information if you want to determine if you've been compromised. At its Made by Google event uh, happening on October 4th, Google is set to announce the Pixel Watch 2. In fact, the company has... <laughs> <laughs> given us videos of it, it they're announcing it nine to five google sources say though that the watch will include the fitbit fitbit sense 2's electrodermal activity or eda sensor which lets the watch track and manage stress levels a temperature monitoring sensor apparently also will check skin temperature on demand which would even though other watches do something similar make pixel watch 2 the first to actually do this uh, on device. Google also reportedly will redesign Fitbit's app Workout UA on the Pixel Watch 2 to integrate more closely with Google Fit's Wear OS app, add new personal safety features, and offer real-time translation with Google Assistant's interpreter. 
All right. Details about Microsoft's internal conversations have been slowly being reported all over the internet lately uh, because of public court documents. Now, you may have seen this and thought, well, that's odd. Why, why is Microsoft's filings becoming public uh, when the FTC withdrew its lawsuit on July 20th? Well, they shouldn't have. More than 100 documents were uploaded Friday to a website run by the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California, and the United States Federal Trade Commission told NBC News, we didn't do it. <laughs> uh, that's not an exact quote, but uh, they said Microsoft uploaded those documents in error. They weren't supposed to be uploaded. It wasn't the FTC that did it. Microsoft has not commented on this. Whatever the case, the revelations do keep on coming, do they not, Sarah? Yeah. So, for example, Phil Spencer uh, sent emails back in August of 2020 saying, Getting Nintendo would be a career moment, and I honestly believe a good move for both companies. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> Microsoft buying Nintendo would be a good get, certainly. Nintendo for the might former. have something to say about it, but sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> Mario, uh, other e what? <laughs> yeah, other emails indicated some other stuff. Uh, quite a data dump here. Microsoft was interested in acquiring almost any game studio you can think of. For example, Warner Brothers Interactive, Bungie, Sega, Square Enix, among others. There were also three-year-old emails showing unannounced games in development, including the Oblivion remaster, Doom Year Zero, the Fallout 3 remaster, a sequel to Ghost Right Tokyo, and Dishonored 3. But the set of documents getting the most attention were around plans for some next-gen Xbox. Yeah, and these are slides, so they certainly are legitimate plans. Uh, it doesn't mean that the plans haven't changed since these were made, uh, but here's what they say. One is codenamed Brooklyn, spelled with an I instead of a Y, which would be a Series X console with two terabytes of storage, so twice what the uh, Series X has now. Wi-Fi 6E, a cylinder design instead of the boxy look, no disc, that's why you need the extra terabyte, and listed at the same price as the current Series X, $499. On the slide, they say they indicate it would come in June 2024, so June next year. There was also a slide for an updated controller codenamed Seabile, S-E-B-I-L-E, Siebel, Sebel, uh, yeah. with precision haptic feedback, modular thumbsticks, some kind of direct cloud feature. Uh, that one was listed as coming May 2024. And there were a few details about the next generation of Xbox in 2028. That's the most intriguing one. It would support cloud hybrid games. So Microsoft Flight Simulator is an example of this now. It's running locally, but it pulls a lot of its weather data and things from the cloud. And the idea seems to be that hardware would handle displaying main characters. It would run DirectX and do ray tracing and stuff like that. But the cloud would deliver background elements, other kinds of data. Uh, there's an indication that they might consider multiple console models with varying degrees of reliance on cloud, including a thin OS client, which would be almost entirely in the cloud and could be a handhold, handheld game that they would sell for 99 bucks. All of this information is a year or more old at this point. Uh, but Sarah, given all of these things we've <laughs> talked about, how did this get uploaded by mistake, do you think? Uh, that was my first question. Like, okay, uh, just assuming that everyone at Microsoft knows what they're doing, this was just one of those errors that nobody could predict would happen, but why? Um, apparently, this is a PDF thing. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of talk out there of, of like, why would Microsoft do this? Do they just not know what they're doing? Did they assign an intern to all of this? No. <laughs> okay. So assuming that that's not the case, apparently um, uh, one of the scenarios that I read online was uh, sometimes if you attach a PDF to an email, for example, and that email ends up being something that is uh, needed to be, you know, uh, uploaded to some FTC server, right? Um, and there are multiple extensions and you say, well, pick this one, but not the other ones. Sometimes when it's a PDF, they all get compounded together and you end up with a big data dump that you might not have originally wanted uh, uh, the recipient uh -huh. to get 
because so they were trying to upload one thing and then accidentally everything else got included is that kind yeah, of yeah and the there? the person who was explaining this said this has happened to me with acrobat mm -hmm. reader before okay. um so that is something to keep uh yeah. in consideration i think we're going to probably hear more about this um as other people <laughs> come forward and say this also happened to me uh, but uh but yeah i i think i think there is no way that Microsoft was like, ha ha, let's just leak this stuff. No <laughs> yeah, way. For sure, right? They did not do this on purpose. This was a big mistake. And it, was, it wasn't incompetence either. It was, it, it, it's something like what you're talking about. That makes sense to me. Yeah. I just spent the whole time when we've been talking about this story and like reading about this story, feeling so terrible for the person who was responsible for uploading or sharing these yes. documents. Like we've all done that thing where you send an email about a person to the person you're writing about or share something that was meant to be private with your colleagues to public, whatever. We've all made those kind of mistakes. And you know that feeling of your stomach just dropping out your yes. body when you do it. Can you imagine what this poor person went through? There is no control Z for some parts of life. Sadly. I mean, well, I, I think, you know, there are certain scenarios where it's like, okay, this person was uh, you know, going through their email too fast, you know, it was user error, you know, we've mm -hmm. all been there. This sounds a little different, almost to the point where people are like, hey, heads up, everybody. Uh, <laughs> PDFs can can do some weird stuff. Um, and that's why the FTC is like, thank you for <laughs> this embarrassment of riches, but we didn't do this. You I don't even think us. it helps the FTC because they already withdrew the case. So the, the, Could all they they're getting is- not because of this. This was all stuff that was in the court cases anyway. Yeah. This, you know what yeah. I mean? So this was all right. part of discovery. It yeah, was just public outrage public. or, you know, e e yeah. if you could even call it that way, I guess. I guess it's still over. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, what's not over, the development of just walkout technology. Amazon uses that in its convenience stores and grocery stores with ceiling-mounted cameras and sensors that track items as you walk around the store so it knows what you take with you when you leave so it can charge you properly. This doesn't work for everything. For example, in the Whole Foods that I, I have gone to that uses this, the bananas have to all be packaged together and they all have to be, I think it's six bananas. Uh, because otherwise it's too hard to track individual bananas. It also doesn't work for clothing because clothing's floppy and it's hard to tell what shape it is. Not to mention, you really don't want to have a system of cameras and sensors in a business that requires people to go into fitting rooms and change their clothes. Uh, so you're not going to get clothing stores to put a series of cameras up on the ceiling. However, Amazon thinks it has a solution, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's introduced a new version of Just Walk Out for clothing stores that uses RFID chips. So stores already use little RFID chips to manage inventory. This is pretty common practice, especially if you're, you know, a larger store that that uh, moves a bunch of merch. Instead of tracking items throughout the store, in this case. Amazon customers would walk through a gate that can read the RFID chips on their way out. Even if the customer's like wearing a new outfit, they would all be scanned because you have to go out a certain way. Amazon tried the system for clothing, sold at a few uh, Seattle Kraken hockey games earlier this year, and is now launched for Seattle Seahawks NFL games. This, I got the ick with this story, even when you explained that actually there's not going to be the system of cameras. It's obviously, it's a new system. There's something about this that, uh, I, look, I think the Just Walk Out technology is amazing. It really is for things like food and those kind of things. It's been, it is amazing. Although it's noticeable, there's not a huge amount. Maybe this is a London and England thing. I'm not noticing a huge number of Amazon stores popping up. But anyway, maybe no, that's that's, that's a true here too. Yeah. yeah, they're they're not widespread. And what I have noticed, and this bears on this story, is Amazon pulling its four star stores, its bookstores. Mm. But it did open a clo a few clothing stores. In fact, there's one in Glendale that I that I've been to. Uh, so it does feel like Amazon's maybe shifting its focus to clothing and retail yeah. that way. Yeah, because I mean, it's the, higher margin. the announcement was not like hey, the whole ceiling camera thing didn't work for us. This is, here's no. how we're going to be able to handle the apparel part of, you know, Making a lot of retail stores, including yeah. third-party retail stores. Yeah, sure. They don't have to be Amazon branded. I, you know, my first reaction to this is, and listen, I am not a crook, 
but you know, <laughs> how, how would this be circumvented? Cause if you don't go through that RFID scanner at the end, then you technically didn't steal all that stuff that you stole. But I mean, <laughs> you know, that's, I mean, <laughs> theft is always a problem, uh, in retail no, stores. Every, so yeah. th this perhaps is a better way to handle it. I think, Fan Actually, merch, that, especially at like, you know, hockey and football games. Great example of how this works. It sounds like they've had pretty good success at yeah, in airports and, and, you know, certain event venues where people are kind of in there for a certain purpose. They want to get in and out quick. Every concert I've been to that has one of these convenience stores with the just walk out technology has been broken. <laughs> like it, it's never, it's never working. They always have a person at the end, like, yeah, sorry, no, we have to ring you up. So I'm not sure what's going on there. It's probably, it's yeah. probably just my personal experience, but. Forgive me, this is, if this is a stupid question, but at what point do these RFID tags go for one of a better phrase offline? So if you're getting a piece of clothing, you buy a piece of clothing, um, you obviously have to clip out the tag at some point or that has to go offline at some point, the tag, because otherwise, you know, none of us would want something in our clothing that we bought from Amazon that's, well, that, where the tag that's is not still new. online. You've got RFID chips in your clothes right now. I almost sure. guarantee it. Yeah. So so that's that's not new. Uh, the the I don't know, though, if the chips are in the tags or if they're in the clothes themselves. That right. Is yeah, that was one of my questions, too. I've never really... I understand RFID. I've never really sure. thought about uh, how my clothes might be. I don't know if you're really going to be a conspiracy theorist, potentially like could be tracked. tracked. Yeah. 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 You know, as I wear them throughout the world um, kind of thing. I mean, that's not a huge concern of mine, but it, it is a concern if it's possible. This is one of those stories, though, where it's all things, the theft the tracking, it's all things that exist right now. It's just the yeah. fact that we put Amazon's name on the story that makes everybody think about it and go, well, wait a minute. I don't know if I want that. Oh, if people are going to try to rip it off. I feel like it's it's actually going to reduce theft because right now with a retail clothing store, you can just walk out <laughs> without paying. Uh, you just need to figure out how to keep the security tag from going off. All this is doing is saying, hey, that security system that's keeping you from walking out uh, and the alarm going off will now just charge you. Well, it'll just automatically charge you. So it almost is like, well, you can't walk out without paying because we're going to scan the clothes and charge you. Yeah, I'm picturing, do you remember those old big gray tags that you used to have sometimes in shops that someone on the desk would have to like punch out of the clothes. Oh yeah. Whatever. Those, those still exist. I yeah, had those exactly. So the other day. This, yeah. this is obviously a bit neater and smarter and cleverer than that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, still seeing issues of like what happens if the tag, well, maybe you get luck and the tag doesn't click and you get your clothes for free because obviously with the old school system, the problem would be you'd get to the desk, think you've paid and some uh, shop assistant had left the tag in your clothes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, folks, uh, we know a lot of you are Android users. Uh, if you haven't already subscribed, you got to check out Android Faithful with Android aficionados Ron Richards, Wentwe Dow, and all the latest Android news and information. Catch it Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific live, or get it at your leisure on your schedule at androidfaithful.com. The UK's public sector broadcasters like the BBC, ITV, Channel 4, and Channel 5 are launching a new digital service called Freely to deliver live TV over broadband. Freely is being developed by Everyone TV. That's the name of the organization that provides TV without cost in the UK and is jointly owned by the aforementioned broadcasters. Everyone TV has a three year funding deal from those partners, which is meant to cover the launch costs of the service marketing push so people understand how everything works and the service freely will be built into next gen smart tvs starting next year if you've got an old tv you have other options but listen if you live in the uk you probably have a pretty decent understanding of how public broadcasting like the bbc for example works but for the rest of us charlotte the uk does work independently in this way so how does this change the way that people consume free content. 
Yeah. So obviously the context of public service broadcasting in the UK to basically watch live, t- for all intents and purposes, to watch TV in the UK, you need to pay the license fee. It's £159 a year. I always say it's the best service subscription um, I ever pay, streaming subscription I ever pay, because it covers so, so much. But anyway, that's a different conversation. What's going on here is, as you explained, Sarah, is that these public service broadcasters, so BBC's, the BBC, which is one, two, it's got three and four as well, uh, ITV, which is, oh, for old school is Channel 3, and then Channels 4 and 5 are combining for this service. And I, when I was reading about it, I really liked this idea because basically, as you, as you said, it's going to be built in to, you know, updated smart TVs, which is great. But it's going to provide things like a scrolling service, you know, a t- proper TV guide, the ability to jump between channels and things like that. Because obviously now, if you just want to get your uh, TV provided by the internet, say you want to use, I don't know, you've got the apps for all those public service broadcasters, but you're not watching on TV. You kind of have to jump between the apps. You know, you don't have that scrolling, jumping from one channel to the other. Oh, I quite like that that's on. Yeah, it sounds almost like what Pluto TV has been doing. Yeah, I think it's going to have that vibe. Making a, you know, giving you a a channel guide that, you know, otherwise you had to kind of hunt for before. A proper channel guide. You're staying in one place, which I think is really nice. All those kind of things. And obviously between these broadcasts, they have a hell of a lot of content. I I believe there's an on-demand element as well, but it's not going to replace things like the BBC iPlayer, um, which obviously is a very, very popular service. I personally think it's one of the best um, streaming apps out there. It works really, really well. I think it's quite underappreciated. But so this is putting all of that in one place what it is replacing or is an update on is freeview which you used to like when i was a student eight million years ago to get freeview tv i had to buy a box and plug it into the little tv in my student dorm room you know and that gave you a whole host of channels instead of just the one two and three that was actually going to be my question because i i know that uh the the partners who are part of the you know everyone tv initiative say well, okay, if you, you know, starting in smart TVs in 2024, this will be built in, it'll be great. Yeah. Um, if you don't happen to have one of those TVs, you could still get some sort of a, a external box, I would think, to be able to enjoy the rest of this. I mean, so many, so many people, myself included, already do that. And, you know, that's, yeah. that's the deal. Yeah, I don't know what the hardware side will be, but obviously there'll still be things like, as I said, the BBC iPlayer, there'll still be ITV's equivalent of that, which is called ITVX. There will still be the Channel 4 player. There's still going to be the Channel 5, you know, those st- still standalone apps, as I understand it, having dug into this a little bit, will still exist. But this is trying to make it easier for when you buy, plug in your TV and this should all be that, I think is the basic vibe. Uh, the important thing to note is this is being delivered over the internet. It's for broadband connected homes. So that's because there's a bit of, I haven't had a chance to dig too much into this, but there's looking to be some changes to the old Freeview system and potentially shutting down or selling off some of the frequencies. So I think the idea is basically to try and move people to internet uh, connected services as opposed to old school terrestrial services, you know, over the air services. Uh, for me, I kind of think this all makes sense, actually. I really like the idea that it's a service bringing everything together, but you're not jumping between apps. You know, you might not be using a traditional TV system, but you're not jumping through apps, which you know what it's like. Sometimes you think, oh, I'll just start on this and I'm in Netflix and then oh, I'm in Netflix. But sometimes like you want to jump between channels and this will be a place to do it. Yeah. There's also, you know, think of things like Samsung TV Plus, which I have on my TVs at home. It's a pretty, like, there's some good stuff on there. I watch CNN through that, for example. But it's also a pretty clunky experience. It's mostly filled with stuff that streamers and broadcasters just want to find a way to get anyone to pay anything for. Like, it's not great content. This is going to be substantive content.
It seems I, like a good way to just uh, to to ease people into a world where internet is like electricity. It's just something you pay for. You know, you have to have electricity to watch TV too, right? But nobody gets mad <laughs> like, oh, you're making pensioners pay for electricity to watch their television. Internet's becoming like that. In a, in a world where the internet is just normal for every household, this is a great way to ease that transition. I like it. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the pensioner thing because I think there is a bit of a campaign and a backlash uh, where there are concerns about what older people who are used to a terrestrial TV setup will do. And um, whenever we make these transitions, I guess you always have to bear that in mind. But there's no doubt of the direction of travel for all the you know TV services that we use. And it seems to me Freely is moving in that direction. I would suggest it's the right direction. I would suggest it's moving freely in that direction. Oh, Tom. Get it? But maybe I shouldn't. Instead, let's check that. out the mailbag. <laughs> <laughs> we got some good responses to uh, setting apps to use your own voice. Uh, this is iOS 17 related from our discussion with Justin Robert Young and Chris Mancini yesterday. Specifically, the Carrot Weather app letting you use your own voice or maybe a celebrity's voice to tell you the weather. Mark wrote in and said, I get that all of this on device is to improve security, but what happens when you move or upgrade to a new device? These companies never talk about that. What if you decide you want to train the voice to be a loved one? Maybe it's a parent, grandparent, significant other, whatever. This is some someone that is no longer with us. What if I want to get my device trained by a loved one who's not nearby or easily accessible? Is there the ability for somebody to send the 15-minute training as recording to me? Asks Mark. What about if I decide to get an iPad after training my phone? Can I share the training with my iPad? Mark says, Apple, Google, and Microsoft never tend to talk about this when they rave about how secure on-device features are to protect your privacy. There's just no winning, is there? Everybody complains that it's in the cloud and they're going to spy and then they put it on the device and then you complain. And, and then they say uh, you can't transfer. Uh, the, the good news for Mark though, uh, is that you, uh, the reason they don't talk about it a lot is it's just part of the migration. So if you move from device to device, it, it can move. Good question about whether it's easily movable to an iPad. Uh, if you wanted to do that, that, that's, that's a great question. I imagine it could and should be without having to be in the cloud. Uh, the idea of having someone who's not nearby, uh, send training, um, Yes, that is not something easily as easily done, but it wouldn't be as easily done even with the cloud because you'd have to have them log into your account and, and do do stuff like that. So I feel like the better solution there is to just have them record something and send you the recording and then you play the recording. Um, we we yeah. got a uh, uh, we got a recording uh, that Allison Sheridan did uh, of her training. And I have to say, it doesn't really sound like her. <laughs> Do you want to hear a little bit of it? Yeah. Do it. Okay, here you go. I think it's going to be playing any moment now. <laughs> or not. Maybe it won't. Uh, That's why it doesn't sound like her. Yeah, it just sounds mm. like silence. Yeah, it's it like, you way. know, Allison just is sounds smarter than silence. This, this is such an interesting issue, though, isn't it? Crew. This is Allison's personal voice created using iOS 17. The training to create this voice required reading 150 short phrases with a pause in between each, so it took quite a bit of time. The phrases were odd in that they were about just a few things. They included political institutions with sentences like he was in the U.S. Senate for 12 years. There were a lot of years called out, like this happened in the 1970s, and finally the creator... It kind of goes in that way for a while. It's just I, yeah. I'm, I'm going to say, you know, having spent enough time with Allison... This does sound like Allison. You can tell yeah, that it's you can recognize it's, her. Yeah, it's machine generated. But uh, to to your point, Mark, I you know, and I think your mileage may vary when it comes to wanting you know people who are inaccessible to you be, because they're you know they, they don't they're not living anymore or they're just like super far away. You know, it could be something that brings you you know happiness or or something else. But this is not bad. Yeah. And uh, Mark's not alone. There were a lot uh, more than a, a few people who wrote in saying, I don't want to hear myself read the weather, but I would like to hear grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, yeah. etc. A lot I'm, of people were talking about, you, you know, yeah, passed thanks away to everybody people. who yeah. wrote in about that. 
<laughs> it's just, I'm like, why would I want myself? I no, I could do. I could just say I, that I out loud. I find this whole thing really interesting, particularly in the context where I'm thinking of AI and the fears or otherwise around how our voices could or may well be distorted or used in different ways and how you know there can be we know that it's going to be possible or it kind of is already possible isn't it to have voice recordings that prepare purport to be you but are not you it's going to be the same is the same with video i can understand that even with the inconveniences it may cause why the tech companies are really really approaching this cautiously I can, I'm seeing it more in that context of, as opposed to like, wouldn't it be nice to have X or Y family member read the weather to me? Well, Charlotte Henry, uh, you know, whether or otherwise, we are always yeah, so sorry, happy to have downer. you. <laughs> no, 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 it's, listen. Sometimes weather is good. Sometimes weather is bad. Uh, the addition mm -hmm. newsletter is always good. Uh, and we're so happy that you're doing it and so happy that you're on the show more regularly. But let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Yeah. I mean, if you head over to theaddition.net, uh, there's regular blog posts there. Uh, and as you can see on that image, there's a box where you can sign up to the newsletter. Pop, pop your email address in there. And I'd love to have you along. I'd really, really love it if you became a paid subscriber as well, because that's really, uh, I really appreciate that. And if you just want to go straight to the newsletter, it's newsletter.theedition.net. Patrons, stick around for the extended show. There's more Charlotte Henry to come. The UK just passed the online safety bill. And while it does not look like it means end-to-end -end encrypted apps are going to leave the UK, which some like Signal had threatened to do so, uh, there are still a lot of questions and we are going to ask them. Yeah. Just a reminder, though, you can catch our show, DTNS is live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow with Scott Johnson joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>